Welcome to another episode of Free Lunch. It's November 17th. We haven't done one of these in a while. And a lot uh, happened in the country since. There's been uh, an election uh, widely seen as uh, favoring the Democrats, the shift in the Democratic... uh, Sorry, the Republicans, (laughs) the shift in the Republican direction. Uh, uh, Republican won uh, governor of Virginia. Uh, Democrat very narrowly held on to governorship of New Jersey, uh, where he was expected to win by by, uh, blowout margins. Um, so that's a major event. There's also been um, the largest legislative um, accomplishment happening of the uh, of the Biden administration yet with the um, with the infrastructure bill, and it's a good occasion we think to reflect on where the country is politically. Pick up on some topics that uh, took place in the election podcast that Carlos and I uh, were in last year, and just in general get a sense of where we think the country is politically. Um, so let me sort of open it up to general thoughts on what do you make of the election results? So I think the election results showed just a, is a general shift towards the Republicans. And it was something like 12, you know, 12 points in Virginia, uh, 14 points in New Jersey. And what was really interesting is the, the, the shift was really uniform in that um, – the shift was not like say you know vast magnitudes greater in Virginia than in in in, in New Jersey, and in in looking at the election, one thing I, f- I found particularly striking was that there's a report of McAuliffe's internal polling suggested that there was a five point shift uh, to Yunkin around the Afghanistan withdrawal, and so this was this was before this was before the debate. And right, so the five point shift made them basically even. And so, in terms of, you know. The, the debate, we yeah. should mention for anyone who yeah. wasn't following this closely, Yunkin being the Republican candidate yeah. who won, um, the debate was uh, there was a discussion of public education, and there was a widely perceived as a, a gaffe or a, mis- a unpopular statement made by McAuliffe about. Um, Parents shouldn't have that much say in what's taught at schools and in their kids', uh, education. In their kids <laughs> education, even <laughs> even worse, yeah. Uh, and that was um, seen as one of these moments that might have caught someone big. So you're saying the main shift had already happened? Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was clearly it was clearly a gaffe. Uh, I mean, the Republicans had an ad, had an ad out within within an hour. Um, interesting. So this brings us there's some really interesting research in political science, like what's the effect of ads. And there's a really cool paper where uh, a bunch of political scientists at Yale and, and one at UT were able to randomize Rick Perry's media strategy in the 2006 gubernatorial election. <laughs> because basically, Perry knew he was he was going to win, so he allowed these political scientists to randomly spend or not within a couple markets, you know, vary the timing of when ads go out, and they were able to do this with I think like two million bucks. So it was a f- <laughs> Reasonable experiment, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what they found on the effect of advertising is there's there is an effect, but it's very short term. So I think this goes well with the internal polling showed a shift early, and it wasn't that the uh, that the debate was a structural uh, a structural break. That reminds me of a of a in two thousand and when would I did this two thousand seven maybe I wrote a paper with my wife then she was a with a back career that she had as a political scientist <laughs> uh, wrote a paper on information flow in political campaigns and you know as a statistician my job was to write a model that tried to identify spikes in information in prediction markets so at that point in time there was actually trade sports was a was a deep market for yeah. political campaigns and we're using data from two thousand four no. What was it, Carrie? 2000, 2004, 2004. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I'm right. So it was actually, it was probably 2005 they wrote this. 2004, a presidential election. And if you remember a little bit about that, basically the, the, our, our sort of estimates show that there was very little in the campaign that actually mattered. People like, love to talk about, oh, the, the convention was a big event. Nope, it wasn't. None of it was a big thing. The flip-flop ad, remember that Carrie going yeah. back and forth in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sale board, whatever it was he doing, right? The one thing that didn't matter was when the information came out in the Drudge Report about the Swift Boat Veteran Organization. If you remember that is, that basically the folks there were coming in that had spent time in Vietnam with Kerry, questioning his sort of bravery and courage as a, as a veteran, right? So, so he was trying to play out in 2004 as a, his national security you know, credentials, primarily based on his experience in Vietnam. That was important. That information, because it was new. There was new, oh my God, the people that were with you, right? So anyway, so, so 
most of the things that we like to talk about tends to be very no effect, right? And every so often there's something. So it would be kind of nice to see whether the, the, in the Virginia thing was really, was it was that Afghanistan? But your suggestion is that that, that was the, the, the key factor. And then education was just like a cherry on top. Well, I, th- I think ed- the, the education mes- message was just a, a standard grievance against the, uh, the, the party in power. And is it, is it though? I mean, yeah. we have education in, in a topic right now because of the pandemic, yeah. perhaps, right? A lot of folks were dissatisfied with how schools have handled, you know, you can try to focus on the whole CRT discussion, right? Of like, oh, you're teaching crazy yeah. stuff to my kids at school. But I think there was a lot of already animosity, baseline animosity at our public schools based on you didn't manage the whole pandemic thing well. And maybe I want more choice. And, and so I think there was the latent desire there. Oh, ab- ab- absolutely. I'm not, I'm not suggesting this was an issue that didn't exist. I, I, I think this was, though, just the packaging of a, you know, a campaign, a, a, a very effective campaign yeah. message. Right, right. And talking about campaign messages, there's one of my favorite stories of the election was there is a trucker in southern New Jersey who beat the uh, incumbent head, the Democratic incumbent head of the New Jersey State Senate. And he spent like 158 bucks in his <laughs> primary. <laughs> I mean, because he was ch- he was going up against a guy who'd been in office for, you know, 20. I, I'll get the number wrong, but geez, like over 20 years. He was the longest serving head of the New Jersey State Senate, and he was beaten by a guy who didn't spend much and just campaigned door to door and said, "Look, you know, I'm 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 a regular guy, and I I, I think that uh, the you know, this politician is." Been you know not great for our our district and he won and that to me suggests a very nationalized election although you know it's an anecdote although as the saying goes the plural of anecdote is data that's right <laughs> so so the surprising surprising thing to me was uh, that New Jersey was even on the table for the Republicans so do you think that the Afghanistan thing was also the major uh, thing that was moving the needle in New Jersey. I don't know. I don't know if that was moving the needle in New Jersey. I so the, the, the comparison I think when I'm thinking about this election is the the elections in 2010 where the Democrats got completely wiped out. I mean, I, what is it? Uh, Bob McDonnell won by what 10 or 15 points? I think Chris that was the election. Chris Christie won. So you know, Democrats in New Jersey were they were facing. You know, severe headwinds because what was it? The a Democratic governor of New Jersey hadn't won re-election since like 1977 or something like something yeah. like that. New Jersey is not. I mean, yeah. I'm from New Jersey. It's not a. It, it's fairly a safe blue state in presidential, presidential. elections, yeah. mm-hmm. um, but it's not in gubernatorial elections. I mean, we've mostly had Republican governors when I lived mm-hmm. in New Jersey, uh, even while it was reliably voting blue. And there's questions as to why that. Why that is, but you know, Christy Whitman and mm-hmm. and, um, and Chris Christie. Uh, but I think it was thought that New Jersey was so you know so heavy for Biden that um, this time for sure yeah. it wasn't going to happen. And so it might be more regression to a mean um, right. than anything else. I mean, that's the kind of null hypothesis yeah. to explain. This just mm-hmm. happens in this year when we have Virginia and New Jersey. Uh, whatever party's in power gets a backlash and. Um, is there more to is there more to this than that? I don't know. I mean, there could well be. You can think of a lot of things. It could be. I mean, the Afghanistan withdrawal um, was a mess. I think it probably would have happened and been a mess. Whoever was president, but it was a mess, and it was all over the news, and you couldn't imagine it going much worse, right? Um, and there was a lot of contention over the pandemic, over schools. Um, yeah, I like, I, that brings me back to, to one of the discussions that we had with Judge Glock when he visited um, the center, what, a couple months ago now, and you can watch the podcast online when he, he talked with us here in Free Lunch. Um, he Basically, his point was that there's a lot of talk about polarization of the electorate, and, and there's a lot. If you go to the news every day, it's something about, oh, there's crazy here and there's crazy there, right? But for the most part, America is a pretty stable electorate that's very centrist for the most part. And and move slowly. It's, I mean, overall, the baseline has been moving left, especially in social issues. For you know, there's a century trend on that, right? Um, uh, so so I think he, he, his point in the paper that he wrote and came and discussed with us was that there's a lot, there's a lot of hoopla about uh, polarization, but it's not really all that, that 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 meaningful. And I think we see that in these elections in the sense that, and we saw that in 2018, we saw that in 2010, right? A party gets in. 
comes in very excited, thinking that they have this mandate to somehow, you know, a lot of a lot of the appeal of an election, especially the primary elections, is to, to to talk to the ones the more extreme side of your party. But then, you know, you start acting and you start actually governing, and the elector says, "No, I don't want that. I don't want this major shift. I want competence. I want people that can come in and be like reasonable and do get the work done. You know, pick up the trash, have the streets clean, and not crime." And so. It's easy to blame for when those things are not working well, the person who, who is in power, right? So I think Democrats come in. Up to this week, there was no legislation. So what have they done? Oh, well, yeah, there's like regulatory things that change, whatever. But there was no actual change in policy in the country since Biden came in. So the overall, uh, the things that there was a, a demonstration of incompetence, perhaps, on the Afghanistan withdrawal. People don't like that, whether right or left. And, and that's, a, that's a correction, right? And we see the correction. And that correction, I think you have some data on it. Virginia is a, is a gauge for that correction in the sense that Virginia always comes a gubernatorial race after the presidential election. So it's not unusual, right, for that to be a flip associated with, with the effects of this previous election. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, a flip. I have the chart here, which I'll, I'll attach. <laughs> it's the, it, the, the incumbent party has lost the Virginia gubernatorial election think it's yeah basically like the last 11 times or something right <laughs> all statistics wrong or your money back <laughs> all statistics me- all memorized statistics right right but yeah they've, they've lost they've, they've lost a, a lot and i in, in terms of thinking of the distribution of like how bad could this have been for the democrats i think 2010 was a lot yeah. worse so in terms of outcomes like but wait, but this I mean, is 2009. This is, yeah, is the year before, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> is the, is the, <laughs> so let's see next yeah. year how it goes. Want, right? <laughs> yeah, so I, my, I guess my, my, my inaccurate year, but my point is that it could go a lot worse for, it, it could have gone a lot worse for the Democrats. So, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see I mean, next year. It also year. could have gone a lot worse this year, right? We had, yeah. the, there was the, Cali- for the Democrats, there was the California recall election and um, that was a case where the polls called it as a lot closer than it was and knew someone easily, right? And there was a time, at least, where it was thought that it was going to be a bit of a horse race. And then mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think by the end, the polls were saying it wasn't going to be. But um, So it's not like this has been the worst year for them possible even, um, but it's not been a good year for them. Uh, so this goes to another kind of all politics is mm-hmm. national Kind of question. The question about the point of the party coming in thinks they have a big mandate. Um, there's now been a bill passed, the infrastructure bill. We don't know what's going to happen to the Build Back Better bill. Um, and let's, let's highlight the, the infrastructure bill is a bill that got passed with by a lot of bipartisan right. support, right? Yep. Yeah. So 19 senators in the Republican yeah. side voted for it. And a bunch of, and the majority of Democrats did, but they lost quite a few because right, it wasn't. Right. And in the House, Republicans carry the day. Yeah. If the yeah. other Republicans mm-hmm. vote, the bill doesn't pass, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of Democrats, more extreme left mm-hmm. Democrats, didn't vote for the bill. Right. So that bill passed, and it was a bill that was popular generally. It was a, the kinds of things in it, quibble about the details, uh, and some, a lot of it I don't like, I should mention, but um, were things Republicans had been saying they wanted to do for a while, Democrats had been saying they wanted to do for a while. Um, but the whole drama over it passing, the tying it to the the larger stimulus bill, the um, vilifying of some quarters of mansion and cinema for um, you know not being willing to sign on for this kind of transformative bill, uh, the question of what will happen to that bill, what is that that whole drama, which is still on playing? We don't know what's going to happen with Build Back Better. Will it pass? In what form? Um, what does that tell us about the state of American politics? I think it emphasizes the point that I made of centrist, of, of a country that is in the center. Uh, uh, you, have, you have a lot of senators in the middle there. There's this coalition, what's called, um, um, I can't remember now. It's, not something, it's almost like a third way thing again. Like, uh, so the, basically there's like 20 senators, I think, from, they're half and half from both sides that, that um, you know, they agree on, it, 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 it doesn't come up very often, but they sort of agree on some principles and say, okay, if we're agreeing on those principles, we're all going to vote together. And, and I think... There's a lot of vilification of of uh, mention in cinema as being the ones holding out, but there's not, they are representing a chunk of other senators in the Democratic side that are like, yeah, we don't want the more revolutionary bill that you know Bernie Sanders and AOC are trying to push, right? 
that's faction of the party. So, so was it you that mentioned? How, somebody was talking about this. The notion that, that it's kind of like we have four parties now in the uh, in, in, in Congress, and and there's the more national conservatives on on the very right, and there's more like you know Chamber of Commerce conservatives. Then you have the Bill Clinton Democrats, and you have the AOC Bernie Sanders Democrats, right? And and it's sort of evenly broken down between those four factions right now. So this chunk in the middle is not going to let things go extremely in any other side. And we see that. We saw that. They, they came up to an agreement on the infrastructure, which, yeah, there's some bondog or whatever, but for the most part, is a bill that says, okay, I'm going to build br- bridges, roads, internet, like things that most voters can be like, yeah, that's the role of government. We want better roads, bridges, and, and walls, and whatnot. Um, not that kind of wall, perhaps, yeah. but walls for, like, I was thinking yeah. about water. <laughs> dams. 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 Sorry. But dams are controversial, too. Yeah, dams are controversial, too. Uh, um, damn it, there's no... That's how I read it, at least. And I think Yes, the Democrats will most likely pass something on the Build Back Better, uh, but it's going to be a much bare down version of what of what they they are trying to push in the beginning. Now, it might be that that uh, maybe much scale back, given the result of this election and and and, and, and you know how the how they react uh, as a function of that. But I think it speaks again to the sort of like the news about polarization. It's not the reality. I go back to my point about Trump's ears where for all the talk, the bills that were passed were middle of the road tax cuts, standard stuff on the Republican side, and a huge bipartisan bill on criminal justice reform. So there was no change in the country. Over and, the you know orange man bad four years right and really big stimulus bills but that would have gone oh, after yeah, 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 yeah. the end of the pandemic right. that's right yeah. that's right yeah we're bipartisan yeah. again right. exactly <laughs> that's right. that tax bill would have passed you know if you'd President Romney you'd, mm-hmm. you would have gotten the same you know and would I think have gotten the same you probably exactly. would have gotten a, not the same but you would have gotten a cut to the corporate tax rate under President Clinton yeah. so it's, right. that's right that's right um, not as much of one I think probably but your Dima you. Seem to me more skeptical of the idea that there's as much range within both of the parties, or at least within the Democrats, as um, Carlos's picture mm-hmm. is painting. So I don't, I'm curious what your thoughts on this state of things are. So depending, what is the our time frame? I guess where what is the point that we're comparing today to? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think from what we, what I recall, a uh, judge, uh, judge pointed out is that this um, overhype with the polarity doesn't have as much basis, but the center is shifting, and it is shifting left. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, the the two party system, you know, winner takes all that we have, um, th- is alienating. I think some of the voters that don't agree with the center shift left. Um, and perhaps this is one reason why you're now witnessing like four parties. Mm-hmm. I mean, not effectively, but in, in a sense, you're witnessing four parties because I think the center is shifting left. I mean, I do agree to some extent that the result of the elections are revealing that the um, it's still center, even though the center has shifted, but it's still center, not the polarized pictures that is painted in the media. Mm-hmm. But this... this um, Increased number of factions within the two parties are, I do think they are indicative of something that perhaps the center shifting and shifting more to the left is giving room for more people to capture um, straight opinions, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I've expressed skepticism in the past that left and right mean very much as directions. Yeah. But, um, I'll leave that point if people want to listen to the other podcast. Yeah. I, I'm curious about another question, which I don't... Um, I wonder to what extent this four parties business is new. That is, the particular... Um, what they each stand for right now is going to be new. But if we were in 2010, right, we would say, well, there's the Tea Party Republicans and the mm-hmm. mainstream Republicans, and of the Democrats, we would say they were the more progressive and the less progressive ones... And if we went back to 2008 or 1957 or um, or uh, 1972, like, is it is there always two wings within every party, or is there is it true now in a way that it wasn't true in the past? Is there is there a fact about this? I'm not sure. So uh, there's a way to look at this. So there are some very talented political scientists, uh, Howard Rosenthal and Keith Poole, 
created a the, the first real measure of ideology. There's these scores called DW nominate scores, and, and the idea is that um, it's essentially factor analysis, mm-hmm. and you can score people's ideology on multiple dimensions. So DW nominate typically has two dimensions. You have an economic dimension and a social dimension, and in in their in their book, well, they have, they have multiple books, but in one book they show shifts in uh, you can see emergence you can see the emergence of different groups within a party uh, because you know the the Democratic Party today is very different from the Democratic Party of the 1920s is very different from the Democratic right. Party of you know the 1800s and so they. they I haven't looked at the second dimension of the DW nominate scores, but it would be it would be very interesting to see if you had the same sort of patterns you had the last time parties sort of flipped. Mm-hmm. And and I, I yeah I I, I don't uh, yeah I don't know if you're there, but but I yeah. I do think that what's different now, Greg, is that is that absolutely you always had a continuum, right? From whatever, call it right or left, yeah. but div- divergent opinions, right? There's some people yeah. in this opinion over here, some people with this opinion on the other side. And the question is how you spread. Is it uniformly spread in the yeah. middle? Is it peaked? In, you know, I think a lot of the yeah. discussion that we have right now is that the party is hollow in the middle yeah. and then there's yeah. just two peaks yeah. in the tails. Right. That's not, the evidence is not there mm-hmm. for that. I think the evidence is more, maybe this is not maybe more uniform yeah. now. But I do think that the difference is that America used to be more like a bell-shaped mm-hmm. curve. The middle was very, you know, more concentrated, and the tails were smaller. The tails mm-hmm. are bigger now. I think that's fair. So the two sides in the extreme are bigger. Again, that's anecdotal. <laughs> but but I, that would be my read of the situation. I mean, part of what I, I wonder when we think about it is what are these lines? Like, what is the x-axis oh, are, yeah. that we're thinking of this on? Because you can say, well, is it economic or or, or social? But then economic, like... What is favoring tariffs? Yeah. Is that left economic mm-hmm. or right economic? And Everybody favors tariffs now. Now, now yeah. and what I find interesting in political change is the changes that suddenly both parties are pro-tariff. Yeah. They were pro-trade deal for a long time. Like they are now pretty much pro-gay marriage. Yeah. I mean, the Republicans are a little skeptical, but nobody's trying but to nobody's do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So, like, um, it, it seems like things shift, and both parties are cool with the shift, and we don't hear that much about them anymore. Mm-hmm. That something mm-hmm. else becomes a topic to argue about. Now it's. Is CRT being taught in schools? What is it? And you know, or a not gay marriage, right? Okay, so, right. Um, so I, I wonder if, I mean, I try to think of the parties the more the way you were talking about it before. As um, there are different blocks within them about what is their issue. There are these like Chamber of Commerce <clears> Republicans. <throat> we want a, what we think of as a good environment to do business, and there are these. Um, um, uh, you know, religious conservative Republicans, what imp- it matters to us is um, uh, you know, anti-abortion and um, uh, the prayer in schools and, and not feeling like um, our religious values are being uh, imposed upon. And there are in the Democrats different factions and so forth. And uh, there's a lot of, you know, people who fit into both of those things. But you can think about a politician. Is this guy primarily a Chamber of Commerce guy or is he a primarily a family values guy or is he primarily a a whatever? And how much is that what the, like, the, um, if we think about the two parts of the Republican Party and the two parts of the Democratic Party now, how much is it, like, how aligned with Republicanism they are or not, or Democraticism, progressivism, and how much is it, are they about this set of concerns or that set of concerns? And then what would those sets of concerns be even? Yeah, so I, I always have a hard time thinking of ideology on a, on a single line because, you know, suppose you have one belief that's extreme left and one belief that's extreme right. If you're just averaging out your ideology, you're a centrist. Right. When in fact, like, there's no... You're, you're, in, in this example, you're not, a, you're not a centrist at all. You have one far left and one far... The problem of averages. Yes. Yeah, it, <laughs> And so, yeah, I, I, I find it really hard to think about, you know, ideology as just one group because th- th- there are issues where, you know, Mike Lee votes with Bernie Sanders. They're, they're not, ma- they're, to be clear, they're not many of them. But there are some. <laughs> but, there, but, but there are some. And if you just think of ideology as, you know, just on a single line, okay, you know, Bernie Sanders is going to be on the left, Mike Lee is going to be on the right, and, you know, never should their interests cross. But they do. But, but they But they do. And in some very interesting ways. And when we analyze that as Mike Lee's on the right on this, yeah. but on the left on that, that's fixing the kind of average identities of the parties as right. the polls by which you measure. Whereas the way I think about it, 
Like, my views are consistent. I'm the pole, and everyone else is divergent from me. And I think everyone ought to think of it that way. Like, you ought to think, like, I'm not some hodgepodge of eight different So let me, let me, let me submit a, 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 a hypothesis that, I, again, it's my view of it, but, but uh, um, you know, there's a lot of talk of diversity of thought these days around here and around the city in particular after the announcements of that last week. Um, I would say that the Republican Party right now, it's a way more diverse intellectual party than the Democrats are. The Democrats, I want to. So you, you, you mentioned Mike Lee, which is yeah. a very interesting yeah. one, right? Um, I think so. So you know, I would not put Mike Lee, which is a very right-leaning person, a lot of issues. I would not put Mike Lee next to Tom Cotton or even Ted Cruz. Right. Um, but you know, I would put them very far away from Mitt Romney or the Alaskan Senator Murkowski. Or you know, so there's a, I think the variability of views and and and, and things in the, in the in the whereas in the Democrats you hear about there's everybody and there's two cinema and 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 and, and mentioned these days right mentioned well, perhaps I mean, is the only one. But you like, were saying they stood for yeah, some but, but quieter, they're quiet. Larger they're group. quiet exactly, but they're very quiet. And I think because the, the sort of tolerance to a variety of ideas in that party right now. It's not, you have to say things in the exact same way. You need to use even specific language about things. It's a party that's very, I think that there is a, a discipline that came from the past few years, in particular during the Trump years, that, of, of like what you are, as a, what you stand for, what, you, what at least the sort of national picture do you want to be, that I think is very homogeneous right now. And, and, and again, I think I, I, I maybe overreacted to this because the homogeneity that we have in our campuses, for example, that shares a lot of what the sort of top line Democrat, uh, um, it is the party of Bernie Sanders. Whether we like it or not, that is a party of Bernie Sanders. He might not be able to have the votes to do what he, but that, I think the picture, he lost two presidential nominations in a row, but it's his party. Um, and, and I think very, there's very few people willing to say, oh, I'm different. Whereas in the Republican side, even during the party of Trump, the Senate stood to him and said, no, we're not voting for some of these things. We're not going to repeal Obamacare. We're not going to do this because you had a number of senators that said, absolutely not, and, and, and fought him. But I don't think we have any McCain senators right now. It was McCain. It was McCain was uh, uh, the guy from Arizona and one more. And, uh, oh, Romney was Flake. Flake. Flake, yeah. So there were. Who uh, dropped out, though? Didn't seek the right. election after. That's right. That's right. But there was, uh, I think there was a lot more of disagreement in the ranks there than it was in, I mean, in, in the current how would we measure this? I mean, one way we might measure it is how many people have left politics or left the party um, because they're seen as outside of the consensus uh, over a given time period. That would be one measure. Um, anecdotally, I know of some cases of Republicans mm-hmm. and not of mm-hmm. Democrats, but I don't know all the cases, so right. I would right. not be surprised to learn that. I'm, you know, uh, oh, that, However that measure went. I don't know how else we might measure it. I know that if you listen to many of the talking heads, right, they have the opposite impression, that there's um, yes. a lot of conformity in the Republican Party. Over, and I think there is a lot of conformity over the person of Trump. But um, whether there is over other things is a, you know, that's... And there's a lot of conformity in the Democratic Party over the person of Trump. He's a very polarizing right, right, uh, right. A person in politics. And I think rightly so, incidentally. I think you mentioned orange man bad. I think the thing pilloried by the issue orange man bad is more important than any of the policy issues there i think what trump represents is a cultural shift in regard to politics that's a bigger thing than the actual policy shifts but that's a bigger question and how would you think about that influence of trump in this the virginia election how did yankin dealt with it would you describe him as a trumpian i think it's a hopeful sign that you can have a republican who is not flying a big MAGA flag and tr- dressing himself up in Trumpism, but not distancing himself in such a way that he can capture the, the, the same voters, and that those voters don't demand that someone be... They might bristle if you say something bad about mm-hmm. Trump, but they're not all about, this guy's got to sound like Trump. So I was... Um, you know, I didn't follow that election and his messaging super closely, but I mean, I was pleased that he won. I would have voted for him if I was in Virginia. One interesting fact that I forgot to mention about that election is that turnout was way up. And so this goes against the narrative that, you know, greater turnout is bad for Republicans. There's, I was reading that the turnout in the Virginia gubernatorial election was the highest since 1997. 
And Virginia actually, Virginia had a bunch of reforms before that made voting easier. Like they made election day a holiday and they, they had a bunch of others that I forget. So I thought, you know, sort of departing from the previous point, but I thought it was great that um, turnout went up in Virginia and the Republican won. So just countering the narrative, uh, uh, countering that the, the, yeah, the voting the, access somehow yeah, easy as yeah. a vote is something that benefits Democrats, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. I think whatever way that narrative goes, mm. it's a bad thing if the country comes to think mm. that how many people have it, how easy to vote yeah. favors one party or the other. Uh, or, it's bad or, if it's true, and it's bad if people think right. Right, it's bad if people think that whatever style in which you run an election favors a party. That's a right. real problem. It should be neutral, right? The, the, the system should. I be mean, it, it could be true on the margin, majority. but yeah. it's yeah. very bad if yeah. people start right, 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 electioneering and voting on that basis. I want this system because my guy will right. win, and so forth. So things that run counter to that are always, I think, very welcome news. Oh, we, we should mention we did have an event at the Salem Center with Jason Brennan, who would have argued that, like, eh, who care? You know, who cares that turnout is is up? I don't think I particularly agree with him on, on that point, but it was a fairly interesting argument about, you know, how voters can evaluate candidates. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's some there's, uh, some also there's some interesting political science research that suggests that there's very little difference whether Democrats or Republicans control a state. Um, a couple of sci- political scientists out of BYU did a study and they looked at a whole bunch of markers in like, you know, economic growth, social growth, whatever. And they found no systematic difference between the parties in terms of how, uh, you know, how states performed upon electing a, a Democrat or a Republican. So I, I guess this is sort of the, you know, downside if you're excited about Youngkin winning in, in Virginia. It's like, OK, he won, but, you know. Oh, nothing. Yeah, yeah, nothing's yeah. going to change. <laughs> so uh, what is the variable that they're measuring in terms of there is no change? They had five separate outcome variables, and then they were looking. They had, they had some clever, you know, difference and difference and regression discontinuity design where they looked at, you know, states where you know Democrats sort of barely won, you know, Democrats or a party just barely won and barely lost, and looked at you know whether or not that had an effect on um, these five outcomes that I can't. I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> remember now. probably because changes are slow, yeah. right? They're slow drifting, and mm-hmm. and, and yeah. Well, so that slow drifting changes um, brings us to another question that I think we should just yeah. start to talk about. Maybe we'll have another episode yeah. at some point, which is what's going on with the economy and to what extent is that factoring into how people are reading politics? I mean, by some measures, the economy is good. Uh, inflation is at a record, not record, but record for a long time, 30 year high. Um, but unemployment's really low. It's a strange economy. Um, people uh, profess to be very concerned about inflation and concerned about the economy and not to be feeling good about the economy. Surely that's part of the the headwinds the incumbent party is facing. Also, surely a lot of what caused it dates back more than this administration, but some things could be this administration, particularly concerns about what this Build Back Better bill will Mm -hmm. be and Mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, So any thoughts on what's going on in the economy and that's relevant to the politics? Dima? Well, uh, one thing that I, uh, like, uh, again, I don't have data, so that's just uh, an anecdote. It's free lunch. Um, Yeah, it's free lunch, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Um, There is a kind of um, a weird situation that I'm witnessing. I'm witnessing the people on the business side uh, competing for labor with the government. And I think the people on the business side, I mean, it doesn't take much to walk around and see how many people are actually asking for we will hire and they're raising the wage. uh, Please, somebody work for me. And um, I think the people on the the, the business uh, men are noticing that now the, the government is hurting business by actually competing for the labor they need. And um, is, is this competing by um, unemployment benefit or what's the, yeah, what's the form it's taking? Yeah, the f- welfare state, unemployment benefits. Um, and I think that's the business people are hurting. And I think they're, they're it's easy for them to point to that as um, as a cause. So do you, um, I mean, the, I think in most states, at least the unemployment benefits wound down. But the, the, the I'm hearing people still have savings. They're not there feeling flush enough to hold out longer? Is that the, is that how you're thinking it's happening? I'm actually not sure. 
I'm actually not sure. Uh, there is a lot going on with the unemployment benefits that I don't think we understand uh, its effect quite well right now. I'm actually not sure. I, 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 we, so let me first go back a bit and say the positive news, which is imagine I came to you and said, we're going to have the worst pandemic in 100 years. We're going to do this crazy thing that we never tried before. We're going to try to shut down our economy for, in some places, six weeks, in some places, two months, in some places, even longer than that. And yet, a year later or a year or so later, the stock of wealth in this country is higher than it was before. And just imagine that. I, I, I propose that to you. What are you going to call me? Crazy. You're going to call me <laughs> crazy. I said, like, there's no way. Kind of glossy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's where we are. We went through a horrible shock, horrible shock. We're still going through and coming out of that shock. Uh, but the stock of wealth, if you look at, for example, all the assets, the value of all the assets that people collectively hold in the U.S., whether, you know, public and uh, privately on assets mostly, is up, right? So that's, like, shocking to me. It's like, wow, that's... But maybe this speaks to the fact that, well, as a um, very wealth economy, uh, an economy that has things pretty well, you know, figured out, it, you can, you're resilient to shocks like that, which is, which is the positive news. Now... Let's go now to the to this sort of like more troubling side, right? Well, you know, yes, I think we had somebody this week coming in, Tyler Goodspeed, that was a part of the, the, the Council of Economic Advisors in the past administration. And part of his argument was that, well, the reason we recover so fast from the dip of, of the, the largest recession that we had since the 1930s is because things were very well allocated before. The economy was like, we're capital and labor, were very well adjusted before. They could do, and, and there were a couple of things that, you know, maybe bipartisan uh, policies they're putting in place to sort of smooth the shock a little bit quickly, and we, we were able to get out of it. That's one thing. But the worrisome part, and when we talk about employment here now, is that it seemed not only, I think, the unemployment issue of like maybe too long of, a, of benefits being available so that people sort of like got out of the labor force or start transitioning to different directions, which might be something that, you know, might be a temporary thing of, of people transitioning to doing other things, right? But I think the age, the population at the end of, of their working lives, so perhaps because of the virus as well, because they're more vulnerable as well and so on, right? those might be the ones that maybe drop out and won't come back. And if that's the case, we lost a chunk of the working population, that's problematic. And, 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 you, and you get the sort of like constraints in the labor market that you see right now. Now, do I see some policies in place right now that are, are, are you know, exacerbating this issue, which is a natural economic transition to get us to the next equilibrium? Yes, of course particularly the energy situation. Mm -hmm. We decided to wage war on fossil fuels since January 1st, 2021. And that's one of the biggest mistakes one can that that, that I think the left and, and, of course, uh, without allowing for nuclear to take off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, exactly. The, and and which will be years and years and years in the making, yeah, right? Yeah, but the, the 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 assault, the direct assault on that industry, is is something that well reduces supply in that industry. Prices of energy are going up a lot, and that's a giant component of what's happening in the, in the inflation side. Not only there's, there's there's lots, right? But I think that's what, one of the things that people are feeling the most. This winter, you're going to have gas bills in Massachusetts that are going to be twice as big as last year. Twice. At the same time, that you know, every, it, 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 energy impacts everything, right? Grocery, right. grocery prices, everything. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the, the, the hypocrite, the, the hypocrisy of, mm -hmm. of an administration that's waging war on fossil fuels, goes to Glasgow saying we're going to cut emissions, blah, blah, and is asking OPEC to pump more oil because mm -hmm. gas prices are high. And then you it's just there was like, a, uh, an item today, which is, um, or, or late yesterday, which is that Biden just asked... Khan, the FTC chair, we want to have a free lunch about at some yes, point yes. to investigate whether Chevron and Exxon are keeping you know, prices up, too yeah, much it, and it, price exactly, gouging. Exactly. It, it, um, it, so that's the solution to this. Is, exactly. Yeah. Anyway, so that, um, that I think is the one piece that there's probably others, but I think that one is, is, is really obvious uh, as, a, as a problem right now. I mean, yeah, how that that seems, there might be a connection on thing, but it seems separate from the employment one, mm -hmm. but um, uh, and it might be that nothing could have been done about the employment issue. It might have been, you know, older people are going to leave the workforce, they're right. going to be slow to come back in. If I don't know if there's data about, like, who's missing, you know, from, mm -hmm. from work now. Uh, there might be. Someone might have studied this. Um, someone must have. But. Uh, a question I have about this, which is really interesting, too. Three of us here are teaching a class this semester where labor comes in a lot, labor economics comes in a lot, and talking about minimum wage and immigration and so on. 
Um, you mentioned the three of us who are le- not economists. Not economists. <laughs> that's right. The one economist in the room is the one that's not teaching the class we do. Is that's Dima, yeah. the economist. Uh, <laughs> what happens when you put a political science, a statistician, a philosophy? <laughs> that's the beginning of a bad joke, right? <laughs> we'll see in the course. We'll see at the end of the that's semester. Right. That's right. That's right. We'll see how well they took the joke. That's right. right. That's right. Um, but but in the labor side. We also hear these stories of millions of people coming into the country, right? Like a crisis in the southern border, which, you know, if that's true, that would alleviate the pressure on the labor, on the labor markets. And, and so I, I, that's a puzzle to me, what, what is happening? Yeah, maybe people are coming in, but somehow not enough supply, added supply on the immigration side to offset a bit uh, the sort of drop off. And like, uh, clearly, there's the different skill match, right? If the, the, the dropout in the very skill set mm-hmm. versus the drop in being in the, mm-hmm. on the sort of low skill set. But if, if the anecdotal evidence that even the low skill labor prices are high by a lot right now, you see signs around town of like we're hiring to flip burgers for twenty bucks an hour, right? Mm-hmm. So and all through the pandemic, it's been very hard to get um, manual labor and labor in the construction mm-hmm. trades, mm-hmm. and a lot mm-hmm. of that is migrant labor. Migrant labor. So I think yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, a lot of people are coming in right now, but it, it seems like we had a period where border enforcement was tougher. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe it had to be because of the pandemic. Maybe it was because of the political winds. But um, if you think our economy, to a significant extent, runs on uh, immigrants, including illegal immigrant labor, um, then, you know, getting a a quick, you know, flood of it now might not make up for a couple of years of having it really down. Yeah, and, and, and it just maybe since there's a transition time, right? Come in and don't start working right away. Right? And there's you don't like, have the skills and there's yeah, some adjustment right. to there's figuring adjustment out. Time, right. uh, and it might be the economy just has to shift in other ways, people's spending preferences and what mm-hmm. they do. I mean, this has been a massive cultural event. It's going to change. Right, Do people right. want to have a bigger yeah. pool or take more vacations or whatever? And it might be that the economy right. just takes time to get people doing the things that people want done. Right, right. We should also note on immigration, a friend of the center, Brian Kaplan, would argue that we should have we should have completely open <laughs> open borders, and that would vastly increase the wealth in the U.S. So he, he, of course, allows for you know transition time, but right. there 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 is an interest there is an interesting argument there yeah. as to like it. You know, okay, so we we have people coming over, but that's that's not a bad thing. That's right, over, that's right. overall a, a very a very positive thing. Right. If we have shortage of labor on the yeah. margin, if the border was yeah. tougher right now, the shortage would be higher. There's no yeah. way that that's not the case, right? The shortage would be higher. So so maybe it could be smaller yeah. if we had a, a more smarter <laughs> immigration <laughs> policy. Um, and you could, I mean, I'm in, I'm in favor of uh, of open immigration, which I see is somewhat different than open borders. I, open borders sounds to me like anyone could just walk across. I think they should have to, you know, like say they're coming across and who they are, and you know maybe there should be some checks. But what's your definition of open immigration? Anyone who wants to come in who's not a felon and passes a few security checks and so forth should be allowed in. Um, but there are ways to you can tie that to employment, right? So you can say anybody who has somebody willing to hire them can come in, and there are ways to do it that tie it to employment at least as 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 uh, transitional measures. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, or have, you know, I mean, there are all kinds of different options for policies here. Where should we go next? Do we want to talk briefly about, uh, in the Build Back Better, the attempt to reinstate, uh, SALT? Yeah. Um. (laughs) Uh, the biggest tax cut for rich people? Yes, that's, uh... Bernie Sanders platform, tax cuts for rich people. Um, yeah, so the SALT is state and local taxes yeah. deduction. That's a tax expenditure in the, the way the, the, the feds talk about taxes. That was something that, um, you know, I, let me go back to something we did in the Salem Center. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the first events in Salem Center was started in late 2017. That was when the debate of that bill was coming up. Uh, and I put a set of economists together, and th- those were actually economists, and those were what they were talking about. <laughs> and, and I asked the question that I posed in the beginning of the discussion was like, okay, if you were to design from scratch a tax bill, a tax code, what would you do? So all of them describe what would be ideal from an economic point of view, because of course we we're, we're here sitting on the outcome of like 
many years and, you know, the sausage making process of getting where we are, right, which is difficult. But let's assume you're starting a country from scratch and you're going to design a tax policy. What would you do? So all of them wrote, said what they would do. And there's a lot of consensus, actually, when you think about uh, how economists think about what an optimal taxation policy would be. And I asked them, all right, so in light of the provisions of the 2017 proposal, because it was a proposal before it got passed, does that get us closer or farther from what you just said? And those are folks on the left and right. Mm -hmm. And all of them said closer because that bill had the feature of widening the base and lowering the rates, which is like a very basic, 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 basic aspect of what we think the optimal taxation is. Mm -hmm. You reduce the disincentives in all dimensions of the income scale and, you know, makes it smoother. Um, so SALT was one of those provisions that made, it, made sure that you widen the base. You're not taking, you're not, you're not saying, you know, uh, uh, you're getting more, more fewer uh, uh, distortions in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the code. But that's a, you know, politically, you took money away from Californians and New Yorkers and New Jersey people, right? Mm-hmm. Well, who do they vote for? Democrats. Democrats come in, what do you want to do? Give their money back to them. It's just like, you know, it's taking from Texas and giving to Californians. That's what that is. So there's no other justification. There's no equity justification. There's no it's efficiency. It's bad on equity. It's, it's, bad, on equity. it's, it's, it's bad on equity. It's bad on equity. The exactly. vast majority of the gains go to people well, making over like $800,000 a year. The majority <laughs> policies Democrats yeah. put in place are bad on equity. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> and they all justified on yeah. equity. So, so uh, when you were uh, contemplating the optimal tax policy, you were talking what was on the table, just uh, different ways to oh, I mean, uh, do the tax brackets for income tax? No, no, no. I was asking general, like, you know, free free range. Think about, yeah. Okay. And uh, some people would start, well, just tax land because that's inelastic Mm -hmm. and whatever. Or just tax death, which is like, you know, another one that... that Tax what? Death? death. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I'm a Republican. You know, I'm a Republican. I'm a Libertarian. I really don't like taxes. But if I would make a, I would make a a trade of like, you know, tax death at 100%. You die, that's it. You're all gone. You know, I'll be better. that's better than any income tax that we have. It's immoral. You take people. There's lots of good arguments <laughs> against it. I get it. But it's, the efficiency gains of that is important. And I think we have such an inefficient tax code that I'm willing to, <laughs> to change it and, and go to things that. But anyway, so, yeah, so everything was on the table. Okay. And that bill got the industry closer. Is near death. <laughs> I know, I know, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You would, you would, you would, absolutely. Um, One interesting story about the inefficiency in the tax code is after I graduated from college, I worked for the Department of Justice as a paralegal in the tax division. And one of the main things I was on is I was helping these very talented attorneys bust tax shelters. And there were some very, very, very creative tax shelters. Mm-hmm. And one of the most creative ones involved, there's the Los Angeles uh, Fire and Police Pension. And if you had a small, closely held corporation, you would essentially give the shares to this pension fund, let it sit in the pension fund for two or three years until the short-term capital gains got in- turned into long-term capital gains. You'd buy, the st- you'd, you'd buy the corporation back for something way below market value, and then you'd, uh, you'd, you'd de- basically be able to declare income at the long-term capital gains rate. And this was all technically legal under the rules, except the IRS has basically said, well, okay, well, suppose you find a way, you know, suppose you find something like this, there's no substance in this transaction. So it is, in fact, illegal. But I always think of that as an interesting example of how, you know, you had some really smart CPAs reading the rules. and They're like, well, if we do this, 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 and jump backwards through this burning hoop, <laughs> we can we can manipulate the tax code. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, yeah. No, it's very difficult, right? So anything that you put it yeah. down, you're gonna have you're gonna have people gaming it. It's, that's so the, the, game, yeah, name the, of the game. The double fact that the code we have is the result of the sausage making and back and forth and a million things like this, right? right. Um, money grabbed for constituents, right? Right. right. Um, that we have, and uh, then you have on top of that the layers of CPAs figuring out how to right, gain right, each right. iteration of it, and we have a very complicated. Uh, if, if you if you ever want to want to uh, propose that I think is incredibly smart, uh, John Cochran in his blog has this what he calls a progressive VAT. So VAT is value mm-hmm. added tax is something that most European countries have, and 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 it's something that the middle class pays the brunt of it, right? So the U.S. of all the talk, 
we have an incredible progressive tax code where the middle class doesn't pay many taxes relative to the, the, the wealthier uh, people. You might say that the overall taxation might not be enough, but all the taxes that are paid to the government, most of it comes from the very wealth in the US. In Europe, it's not like that. In Europe, you have this in the middle of the, of the population paying a lot of taxes, and it's mostly from the value-added tax, which is a consumption tax. That's actually a very efficient tax. Um, what Cochrane has in, his, in, in one of his blog posts is a very careful description of how we would do a value-added tax that's progressive. Because one of the criticisms that, well, if you put a value-added tax, you're going to put, it's you know, regressive. it's yeah. regressive. And, and it's super smart, and I encourage you to find that. Just look at progressive VAT on the Grumpy Economist. And, and it's In a general it's a, good blog. Yeah, it's a great general good blog and, and something that, that uh, uh, it's a really good idea. I, mean, I, think, I take it the basic idea is, I haven't read his piece on this, but I've come across it before, is it's a, it's a, a VAT with a kind of rebate or yeah, on it's the VAT on rebate. It, and, and it's easy enough to do it these days with technology. Like 20 before. or 30 grand you spend exactly. is VAT free it's, it's you get it as a tax rebate. It's as right. simple as that. <laughs> So do we want to wrap up by offering predictions uh, with the uh, with the caveat, you know, all predictions wrong or, or, your, or your money back on whether or not the Build Back Better bill passes and uh, who takes control of Congress next year? So, Greg, do you want to? I think the odds have to be that something called that passes. <laughs> um Although there's a chance now... I'll pick a number, because now, they're, now they're, yeah. they're scoring this thing, and now yeah. the score is maybe at a $2 trillion. <laughs> So it's going to be scored... Again, that number is meaningless, but that's, <laughs> that's the news line. It's going to be a $2 trillion bill, a $1.5 trillion bill, a $1 trillion bill. I don't know. I'm not, I don't have that <laughs> resolution with trillions. I mean, it's just... Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the odds. I mean, I think the odds of it passing at a high number of spending are lower than they were a few months ago. Um, I think how much the money is matters a lot less than what structural changes there are because of new programs. Um, I think in particular we want to think about um, what new regulations, particularly on energy, are in it, uh, if any. And I think um, Manchin has done a lot to strip out that kind of thing from it. Um, I think there's a chance it gets reintroduced now and then he doesn't vote for it and it doesn't pass or it stays out and it passes. Um, the other thing is the new entitlements and particularly uh, pre-K, um, I think is a, uh, a big change to the country. I don't think new entitlements are good. And um, uh, I think that's those kinds of things are the most worrying things about it to me. I think they will pass. They will pass something with pre-K provisions, with an extension of the child tax credit, without work requirements, unfortunately. Um, that's going to be much cheaper. I'm guessing that's going to be on the trillion dollar. And the reason why they will pass with those elements in it, they're going to be much pared down, scaled down versions of it, but they need to be able to say to their constituencies, we did something about pre-K. They cannot afford not to do that, and they're going to bribe Manchin to get that through. So it's going to be pared down. It's not going to be as expensive, but they're going to be able to go to 2022 and say, we passed something on pre-K. We passed something on the child tax credit. Uh, we did something about energy, which they didn't really, anything that's meaningful. But, uh, but and they lose badly in 2022. I think just badly, let me rephrase that. Republicans take control of the House for sure. The House has six different votes right now. It's just no, there's no way to control, unless there's something really bad that Republicans do in the next 10 months, but they don't have any power, so it's not going to do anything bad. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't see a way in which they keep the House. The Senate's a little hard. The Senate, I think, might end up staying Democrat, but that changes the dynamic of the Biden administration for the, for the remaining two years, right? If, they, if, if the House goes to Speaker, I don't even know who that would be. I mean, I think McCarthy, the, McCarthy at the moment. McCarthy at the moment. Right. But I mean, the default yeah. has to be that if um, all three houses are controlled by one party, they lose at least one house in the midterm. Right. That right. almost always happens. And, and, and with the margins now are so yeah. thin, right? Yeah. It's hard to imagine it not right. happening. Right. So, Dima, what are your what are your predictions? Well, if I understand anything about politics, is that there is a tendency to take action, not to not take action. <laughs> So in terms of uh, the bill passing, I guess I'm, I'm with Carlos on this point. I think something is going to pass. Maybe there's going to be some concessions. Um, but the, I think you're, you're pushing against a massive boulder by, by not taking an action. Um, it, I think the, um, the recent elections, um, I see that um, the tide is shifting in favor of the Republicans. That's 
It's my prediction, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I, I, I think the tide is shifting. I, I would be shocked next year if, the, if that House was controlled by the Democrats. And in terms of Build Back Better, I, I'm very, I'm, I'm very skeptical of anything that that, that, that it it pa- it passes. I mean, I, I I could see like some you know really small related bill that's like nothing like the current Build Back Better bill. Well, take the universal pre. Yeah. If that's a particular proposal that we could, yeah. you know, if something called Build Back Better passes, yeah. we don't know who's right. Yeah, but if right. that passes, we know Carlos yeah. is right that it passes. I mean, as a parent, I would love for it. <laughs> you know, the young kid. I would, I would uh, selfishly, I would, lo- I, I would love for it to pass. No, but, you wouldn't. Yeah, that is. No, you wouldn't. Because <laughs> can you imagine the the the, the a federal pre K? Come on, man. Yeah. See, actually, you don't the, want that. You don't a, want your kid there. This is an interesting point because I think uh, one thing that people have discovered during uh, the lockdowns is, you know, you send your kids to school back in the day, you forgot about, you know, whatever they're learning, they're being taken care of in the schools, and I think during the pandemics, people discovered that maybe I shouldn't have been so absent-minded <laughs> with my kids' education. Right. And so I think people are now more cognizant of, um, no, it's not um, a very clear issue that, oh, I would if I'm a parent, I would love mm-hmm. to pass on the cause to others and get my kids' mm-hmm. um, education uh, subsidized. Right, I think right. there is now the question of the quality of the education. If they're sending people, people checks, cognizant. right? Maybe that's one thing. Well, that's uh, what, isn't yeah, that yeah. what it's yeah, supposed Yeah, but there's to a lot of regulations. There's yeah. a lot of regulations in, in associated with like how, you know, how and they're going to... Regulations on pay in particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, it was right. supposed to lower yeah. the lowest salary mm-hmm. you could have and be a child care yeah. worker, but then somehow... Right, right, right. To, yeah. Well... Thank, thank you, everyone. And uh, before we go, we have a disclaimer: uh, the views represented in this podcast don't necessarily represent the views of the University of Texas, or necess- surely don't. <laughs> <laughs> and they may not even represent our views tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you very much, and we'll see you at the next episode of Free Lunch. Thanks, y'all.